Hey everybody, welcome to my presentation. I am Miranda. I'm a licensed nutritionist with a master's in nutrition. Um, and I have had a virtual private practice for the last almost 10 years. And my ultimate goal is to help my clients find a sustainable, nourishing, and delicious way of eating that helps them experience freedom from cravings and helps them reach their health goals. So hopefully um, you will enjoy today's topic, which is eating for blood sugar control and optimal health. Um, so today, um, whoever's viewing this, this presentation may either have prediabetes, diabetes, or perhaps they have normal blood sugar levels. But with any group, um, hopefully you'll get some tangible and helpful information from today. And then just as a reminder, I'm not a doctor, so today's presentation is just for educational purposes only and is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And I think it's important to note that my philosophy is more aligned with functional nutrition compared to conventional nutrition. A uh, conventional nutritionist or usually most registered dietitians will work within a traditional standardized framework, whereas a functional nutritionist takes a more progressive and holistic approach. So my focus is on root cause resolution. So not just giving you a diet that kind of helps manage symptoms, but really trying to um, focus on a diet that helps you get back to health. And that can include resolving um, medical concerns and autoimmune issues and gut issues. And so my focus and my practice has um, uh, where I believe really helps most people. So these are topics that generally help most people feel so much better and optimize their health. That is gut health, blood sugar control, or what's also known as promoting insulin sensitivity, muscle development, and then a healthy relationship with food. So what is health, right? How do I define that? Um, so I'm really honing in on some, some specific biomarkers that the conventional medicine model may or may not um, focus on. And I do have a little bit of overlap, but I'll explain to you what I like to look at when I'm working with clients. So first is um, really focusing on obtaining a waist circumference below 35 inches for women and 40 inches for men. And I do not focus on BMI. So you can see here on the right, there's two people. One of them is healthier than the other, and yet they have the same BMI. BMI. They're both classified as obese. And so you can get, you can run into issues with muscular bodies being obese as well as under muscle bodies being normal on the BMI chart. So it doesn't really differentiate what type of tissue you have. Um, and I think that's extremely important. And another issue that the BMI chart misses is that 30% or more of normal weight folks actually have fat on the inside which is problematic for a for from a health and disease risk perspective. So for these people, just because you have a normal waist, you can experience other metabolic issues like elevations in blood glucose, A1C, triglycerides, and liver enzymes. So this is something to be used um, to look at to say, even though you're lean, um, you're still having metabolic issues. So I do waist circumference. I also like to focus on the triglyceride to HDL ratio. So you just take your triglycerides, divide them by your HDL. So if you have a triglyceride of 150 and your HDL is 50, that would be three. And ideally we want that ratio below two. So this is a proxy for insulin resistance as well as LDL particle size. So if your marker your total is above two, you are trending towards insulin resistance and you're also trending towards um, your body making more 
pro-inflammatory LDL particles. So LDL total that you'd get from your doctor isn't necessarily good or bad. Even Harvard suggests that 75% of people with normal LDL have cardiometabolic, um, like cardiovascular disease risk, so stroke and heart attack. So they're finding that it's not the LDL total, it's more of their particle sizes or subclasses. So we want to promote large, buoyant, fluffy, less inflamed LDL particle sizes. And when we have insulin resistance, we're more likely to create the opposite. We're creating more dense, pro-inflamed subclasses. Okay, so another way to um, look at insulin resistance is to actually test your insulin. So you can go get a fasting insulin, um, which this biomarker increases before your blood sugar ever will for about 10 years. So if you ask for a fasting insulin, you'll want that marker to be below five to protect yourself from developing prediabetes and type two. I also um, focus on vitamin D. So 50 or 60 is what we want to aim for, whereas a, a, a normal level considered by conventional medicine is 20 to 100, but their research shows that anything below 50 or excuse me, 40 increases your risk of developing autoimmune issues. So 50 for vitamin D, and you can ask to have that added to your annual physical labs. And the other thing I look at is ideal muscle mass percentage, which includes a, a strong grip strength. So research suggests that low muscle mass, muscle deficiency, is actually worse than too much body fat after the age of 60. So we really want to think of muscle being our bank account. The more we can invest in healthy muscle, the more we can work it, the more insulin sensitive we are, the more um, anti-inflammatory we are because they release myokines when they're worked. Um, and muscle mass is one of is an independent um, marker for longevity and overall health. So what's the root cause with a lot of our chronic medical concerns in America? And I like this chart that Dr. Ben Bickman has created. He's an insulin and metabolic researcher. He studies cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. And he has um, come up with this chart where insulin resistance is the primary driver for creating or developing heart disease, diabetes, cancer, fatty liver, PCOS, dementia, stroke, etc. So heart disease is likely to happen if we have high insulin resistance or high blood sugar. It creates, um, you know, more water retention. It's more damaging to the arteries. It's linked to creating that higher blood pressure. Cancer generally likes to feed on sugar. Um, fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is what is um, now the most common fatty liver, which is from excess blood sugar getting converted to fat within our liver. And um, dementia is being is being coined type three diabetes. So if, in my opinion, if we want to try to reduce our risk for all, um, you know, the majority of our chronic modern diseases, it's really focusing on being as insulin sensitive as possible. So if we want to become insulin sensitive in terms of what we're eating, I would suggest limiting added sugar intake as number one, customizing carbohydrates based off of your metabolic goals and your current health state, prioritizing protein and filling up on healthy fat. So limiting added sugar intake is across the board, like so important for people to be aware of. Um, it's very common for foods high in added sugar to displace nutrient dense foods. 
And the American Heart Association recommends limiting added sugar to more than 100 calories per day for adult women and no more than 150 calories per day for most men. So this is six teaspoons or 24 grams of sugar. Men, it's about nine teaspoons or 36 grams of sugar. I would add fruit juices in this just because it's processed food essentially so it's extracted from the whole fruit so you're not getting any fiber um, in that and so just keeping in mind that fruit juices should really be kept to a few ounces um, especially for somebody who is focusing on insulin improving their insulin sensitivity um, and then alternatives would be stevia monk fruit xylitol erythritol or I'd add allulose and one good thing about the nutrition label now is that there is a there is a um, total sugars and then added sugars line. So if you look at the total carbohydrates section in bold and you go down, you can see that now we have the ability to um, know exactly how much added sugar is in a serving. And then. You just want to try to keep that below 24 grams for women and 36 for men and four grams of sugar is one teaspoon. So if you have something that has 40 grams of sugar, you know, that's 10 grams or sorry, 10 teaspoons of sugar, which is often seen in a lot of drinks from different um, like sugary lattes. So vanilla latte, mocha, caramel latte, you can easily get many teaspoons in one cup. All right, the next step is prioritizing protein. Pro the protein we eat is used for many different metabolic um, purposes, and it's used for enzymes to make reactions go, hormones and muscle. We are not over fat, we are under muscled. So the long-term goal is to eat 
0.8 grams per pound of ideal body weight for, per day for satiety and muscle mass, which is roughly 90 to 150 grams of protein per day for most people, which divides out to 30 to 50 grams per meal. There's a hypothesis out there that I find really interesting. It's called the protein leverage hypothesis. We it basically states that we will continue to have cravings until we meet our protein requirements. So what people usually do if they have cravings, they're choosing snack foods, right? Ultra processed foods. And so we're never really able to get our cravings under control because we're never choosing, um, you know, hard boiled egg to have as a, as a snack in most cases. Muscle mass is one of the greatest predictors of a healthy long life. So again, it's your bank account. And animal sources offer essential amino acids and are more bioavailable. So I'm very much a proponent of using animal protein as a priority. Um, you can certainly get protein from plants, but usually not enough. And they're usually tied with carbohydrates. So um, that's, you know, one piece. And then the second piece is that plant-based proteins have less of an anabolic effect, which means that they don't promote muscle development as efficiently as animal animal based sources and this is due to their lower digestibility and they are also lacking in some essential amino acids um, and so we need specific amino acids as a signal to our bodies for muscle development the last suggestion is to fill up on healthy fat so are you accidentally making yourself hungry because of your weight loss strategy. Unfortunately, even when we eat the same amount of calories, if the calories are increasing our insulin, which is from eating carbohydrates and blood glucose, they can promote greater hunger sooner. This means you're going to be looking for food shortly after eating a big meal. This can make weight loss very difficult. So, Instead, you should eat fat to burn fat, keep insulin low. So instead of just focusing calories in, calories out, focus on how your foods, your proteins, fat, carbohydrates, influence your hormones. You can certainly lose weight by eating low calorie, high carbohydrate, but you're going to be chasing blood sugar up in highs and lows as well as cravings. Whereas if we can eat more fat and protein and keep carbohydrates lower, you're keeping your insulin low which makes you more metabolically flexible. So you can tap into your own body fat between meals, as well as um, part of that process releases ketones and that helps with cravings and reducing cravings. So it's way easier to lose weight and control blood sugar with a lower carbohydrate, higher protein and fat diet versus eating less food in general, but this, the, the 45 to 65% of your intake coming from carbohydrates. That's requires a lot more willpower because you're consistently more hungry and you're creating higher and low blood sugar. Um, like basically you're creating those highs and lows throughout the day. And one study that just came out was really interesting. It was comparing two diets that are equally matched and being high in calories and this study finds that the diet that lowers insulin uh, the most, namely a diet that is lower in carbohydrates, results in actual fat loss rather than fat gain. This is despite having elevated calories overall. So um, recommended health, uh, fat sources include extra virgin olive oil, nuts and seeds, whole milk, dairy, meat, avocados, coconut products. So basically, if we ate it 200 years ago, it's okay to eat it now. All right, so this is an example of two plates, and most of my clients are eating to plate one. Some of my clients are eating to plate two. So you can see on the left plate, plate one, it's um, non-starchy vegetables is about a third of the plate. You're having a fifth of the plate healthy fats, a quarter protein, and a fifth smart carbs, whether you want to have beans or berries or stone fruit and maybe occasionally some grains like wheat or corn, um, but really focusing on the lower glycemic carbohydrates. And so this would be described as lower carbohydrate, moderate protein, higher fat. People who like macro 
uh, breakdown. It's 10% carbs, 25% protein, 65% fat. And your carbohydrates, your smart carbs, are going to be mostly berries, beans, legumes, occasionally um, some grains, but really the lower glycemic, the better. And then you're going to minimize snacking. And this is, again, best for most adults all of the time, diabetics, anybody else who's in active recovery, who's, um, you know, maybe doing a lower intensity or a rest day. That's where we want to uh, target in terms of what a plate should look like. And then the plate on the right, plate number two, this is for anybody who's maybe lower carb, but carb cycling or someone who's pregnant or someone who's lean and metabolically healthy. Um, perhaps this is somebody who does CrossFit. This is a good post-exercise meal. Um, this is good for anybody who has hypoglycemia um, or needs to put on weight. This is going to be a quarter of your plate non-starchies, a sliver of healthy fats. You're going to have more carbohydrates. Um, and then the protein is basically consistent. So when you increase your carbohydrates, you want to decrease your fat because both of those are energy sources and you don't want both of those to be high at the same time. All right. Another way to kind of think about this is protein, fat and fiber, PFF. So it's a simple equation to help you eat in a way that is nutrient dense and keeps your blood sugar and energy stable. So um, if we have stable blood sugar levels, we are able to stay satisfied until our next meal. And here are some real life examples. So for breakfast, you can do breakfast sausage, avocado, lower sugar fruit like berries. The protein is a sausage. Fat is also in sausage and avocado. And then the avocado is providing that fiber. You can definitely give kids more carbohydrates as they're growing so they can have tropical fruits. Another breakfast example is no sugar added Greek yogurt with berries and walnuts. Greek yogurt has protein and fat. The walnuts are fat and fiber and the berries are carbohydrates and fiber. I like the Purely Elizabeth grain free granola. It's really delicious, gives you that crunch. Kids can have just a grain based oat granola. They can have more fruit on there. And then another breakfast example is eggs with cheese and greens. Eggs and cheese are protein and fat. Greens are protein and fiber. Kids can add some um, toast if they would like. And we want to try to hit 30 uh, grams of protein minimum with our meals. So that can be as much as four or five eggs, depending on if you have cheese or um, some breakfast sausage on the side or even like some Greek yogurt. Um, and then lunch and dinner examples would be salads with steak and olive oil steak. You want to just make sure that you're getting um, regular cuts of meat. So nothing, nothing that is skinless, nothing that is lean. You want to make sure that you're getting, um, you know, regular hamburger or even like chicken thighs with the skin on. Um, and then another example I'll just provide is maybe if you want some noodles, you can try some lentil noodles and then you can do red sauce and meatballs or even you can do uh, Alfredo with some lentil noodles or lower glycemic noodles if you're doing zucchini noodles. But the pasta with a lentil noodle is going to be fiber and protein. The, the cream, yeah, the creamy red sauce is um, the fat and the meatballs are protein and fat. All right, so this is a diagram of what the blood sugar roller coaster looks like that I was describing. So you have this normal blood sugar level, um, basically an artery, right? You kind of want to keep those blood sugar levels within that normal range and within your arteries. And if we're having high glycemic foods and meals, then we're going to be spiking and plummeting our blood sugar levels. So if you start with an unbalanced breakfast, you're going to be spiking the blood sugar. You're going to experience increased insulin, fat storage, inflammation, and mood swings. And your body's going to try to want to reduce that blood sugar because it's not healthy for us to have sustained elevated blood sugar levels chronically. Um, so then if we have that, a hypoglycemic reaction to the hyperglycemia, we're going to experience increased 
increased cortisol cravings, hangry, fatigue, brain fog. So we're going to want to reach for that latte or the vending machine or want to take a nap. And each um, swing, whether it's high or low, causes stress within our system. And we want to get on that blood sugar train. So get on board, right? Freedom from craving, stable energy, your fat burning better, your focus, you have more focus and mental clarity. So that better breakfast is going to have that protein, fat, fiber. You're going to have breakfast sausages or Greek yogurt, grain-free granola. You can do paleo baked goods because they'll have more protein, fiber, and fat. You can go for eggs. You can do um, low sugar berries, half and half, whole like cream, whole milk, etc. Um, you're going to have those higher protein, moderate healthy fat, lower carbohydrate plates, those meals, and you're going to feel so much better. You're not going to have late night cravings. You're not going to feel extremely sleepy, and you're going to feel calm. And this is how. Um, products get us, right? So we look at the front, looks like, oh, healthy, whole grain, it's got figs, it's got fruit. Um, it's really, really important to look at the ingredients. The front part of a box is to advertise. And so we want to be savvy about the ingredients in which we are consuming. Um, so you can see that sugar is pretty high up there as well as corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, all of those are example of sugar. Um, and we don't want to really focus on the calories, which is a big part of what is advertised. We don't want to fall for that low calorie scam. So we want to focus on nutrient dense calories and we want to focus on where we're getting our calories from, um, with again, protein and fat being primarily, um, the bulk of those things so that we're keeping and modulating our hormones and keeping that insulin lower. So don't be fooled by enticing packaging. Um, that's, it's all designed to make you want to buy. It. It's like a mini advertisement on every box. So flip it around, see what's the added sugar content, check out the ingredients. So nourish your body with nutrients, not starving your body by dieting and eating lower fat foods. Um, if I was to give you a goal, I would say start with breakfast, right? So the most important meal of the day is breakfast, and we don't want to screw that up. We really want to be intentional about protein and fat intake at breakfast. Many studies are examining how protein at breakfast affects eating behavior. Some of them have shown that high-protein breakfasts reduce hunger and help people eat up to 135 fewer calories later in the day. Higher breakfast, higher protein breakfast can suppress um, a glu the glucose level after eating as well as your lunch and dinner responses. So this is really important. So you having a lower glycemic breakfast can actually help you have better glycemic control for your, the following meals. Um, but if you skip lunch, then that response for dinner is lost. All right, so I had some Q&A. Here's um, a couple of resources about the Don phenomenon and diet doctor that can be helpful for some people who are curious about the Don uh, phenomenon effect. And I can also give you um, on the next slide, I have some answers to that as well. Okay, so one question was how much protein should I eat before exercise? The answer is that you do not need to eat before you work out. You need to focus on eating enough protein for the day. There's no upper limit 
to the anabolic response generated by consuming as much as 100 grams of protein at a, at a time post lifting. So it's really about zooming out and looking at your overall protein intake for the day. Um, and there was a belief that your body was limited to absorbing 20 to 30 grams of protein per day. And the study just debunked that, showing that if you eat 100 grams of protein after lifting, your body is very efficient with that amount. Another question was, do you suggest a 10 minute walk after meals to lower glucose spikes? Absolutely, that can work really well, though low carb diets naturally prevent glucose spikes. Best nighttime to prevent AM glucose spikes. I assume they were asking best nighttime like snacks. So some people respond some people recommend eating low carb, high fat, or high protein snacks before bed to minimize the dawn effect. Another um, thing you can do is apple cider vinegar before bed. How does blood glucose impact blood pressure? A lot. I already covered that earlier. High carbohydrates diets enhances water retention and blood sugar can be elevated for hours. When I have clients who are coming to me for hypertension, we focus on going low carb and it's crazy how much their blood pressure can respond. They can see a 20 to 40 point drop in their systolic blood pressure, which is way more than what um, low salt diets can do. Is type 2 reversible? Does a strict diet get you off meds or better with a free menu and meds? Yes, it's reversible. Yes, low carb does get you off meds. If you decide to rely only on medication, you will need more of it over time. If you don't follow a strict regimen with your insulin medication, you are likely to experience damage to various types of blood vessels. So anytime your blood sugar is elevated for extended periods, tissue damage is occurring. In hospitalized patients, hyperglycemia is defined as blood glucose greater than 140 milligrams per deciliter. Hyperglycemia can lead to, to the development of infections as well as cardiovascular events. Despite these risks, current guidelines recommend blood glucose to be maintained between 140 and 180. So even at normal levels, we can get damage. So my goal is to really keep blood sugar, um, you know, consistently low or keeping your insulin consistently low and helping you use ketones for energy instead. Best way to track diet, I would do it by macros. You can do that at this app here, get my macros. What am I likely missing from my diet and what is the best source? So um, this is a chart where if you have these deficiencies, you are at risk for developing diabetes. Um, your body just doesn't have the nutrients it needs for optimal blood sugar control. Um, and then... Again, whole foods, right? So nuts and seeds, animal protein, produce, these are going to give you these nutrients. Um, it is interesting, though, if we are in a disease state, we can be at in a higher need for micronutrients. So there's evidence for special nutritional requirements in disease states. So if you um, have a disease, you probably should eat more than the RDA. Um, and then diabetes specifically because if you have a diabetic, if you're in a diabetic state, you can't always get optimal levels with a normal diet of micronutrients. So you could consider supplementing magnesium, chromium, high quality multi, which has methylated B vitamins, vitamin D3, and then even inositol can work really well for making sure that you're not um, getting poor glucose control because of poor micronutrient status. And then there was a study that was done, it was a while ago, by the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in 2020, 2003, 2006, found that children and adults with high intakes of added sugars had lower dietary intakes of several micronutrients, especially A, C, E, and magnesium. So check your processed food intake, check your added sugar intake, they displace nutrient-dense foods. Okay. So those were um, some questions. If you have more Q&A, send them on. Um, I'm happy to answer them on the next 
presentation. And if you feel like you want some additional assistance achieving your nutrition goals, I take insurance and insurance generally covers free sessions for weight loss. Um, so you can get one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling services for either weight loss or medical concerns. And I offer a variety of topics that I can help clients with in terms of goal setting, menu planning, finding the right macronutrient ratios for you. I provide accountability. If you have IBS or IBD, I can help with that. Um, I can help with overcoming sugar cravings, reversing uh, blood sugar issues like prediabetes and type 2. If you're an emotional eater, I can help with healing emotional eating and just having, you know, last, lasting lifestyle change. For insurance purposes, um, coverage usually has no, no, most insurances usually don't have a number limit and no time limit. And um, I'm a virtual practice, so I have convenient televideo appointments. If you um, don't have United Healthcare or Aetna or Medicare. We can also take HSA, FSA, or credit card payments. And then you can learn more about the nutrition counseling services at thrivenutritionmn.com. There's on the upper part of the webpage, it says membership options. So you can learn more about there and you can also schedule from the website. So hopefully today was really helpful and I look forward to providing you with another presentation in about a month. Thanks.